All right, so let's talk a little bit about non-covalent binding interactions. Non-covalent binding interactions. So most drugs are actually going to bind to the targets using ionic interactions. And um, although the initial or the individual interactions that those drugs have with their receptors, uh, their individual interactions are very small. Speaking of the amount of energy, they're usually between 0 0.5 to 10 kilocalories per mole. But there are so many of these interactions happening that you end up having an additive effect. Additive effect. And those individually weak interactions, when added together, can actually create very strong bonding with the receptors. Strong but not irreversible. Not irreversible. Okay. All right. So the likelihood of these interactions to happen is inversely proportional to the distance between the functional groups involved in the reaction. So ionic bonds are the strongest bond. They can form over a greater distance than ion dipole interactions, which themselves form over a greater distance than dipole dipole interactions, which themselves form over a greater distance than um, Van der Waals and other hydrophobic interactions. Right. And so as we take a look at these uh, possible binding interactions between um, ionic compounds and the receptors, if there is, if the distance is too great or if you actually have um, like in this case here, an ester analog where the ion is not revealed. There is no ionic attraction, so there is no initial recognition by the biological target, and there is no therapeutic benefit. Okay. So, as we mentioned before, ionic bonds are the strongest non-covalent bonds that you have individually. individually. Now, um, Drugs bind to receptors. Those receptors are made up of proteins. In order for the proteins to bind to those ionic compounds, you actually need to have um, amino acids with acid or base characteristics. Characteris characteristics. Okay, so for instance, you have the guanidinium group on arginine is a base, and the pK of this group is about 12.5. At physiological pH, it's going to be ionized there. Uh, the same for lysine, the pKa of this lysine group is about 10.5. 10.5. Now, histidine has a pK of 6, around 6. And histidine is it's a weaker base compared to those two here. However, inside of the, of the biological system, it is possible for histidine to have increased basic character in the presence of other molecules. So, for instance, here, if you have an a, um, carboxylic acid group here that could be from aspartic acid or glutamic acid, let's suppose these groups, because of the lone pair of electrons, are involved in um, hydrogen bonding interaction with this hydrogen here. Okay, so let's redraw this and put an H here. 
and uh, so that gives this partially positive and this will have a partially negative charge so rendering this histidine group more basic so depending on the environment you can actually increase the basicity of the, the basic character of uh, of the amino acids now the n terminus of the of the protein can also have uh, can also be protonated at physiological pH. However, most of the time um, these uh, these n terminals are usually modified. Do have them be modified? Um, sometimes they are acetylated, and so on and so forth. But it is a possibility to remember. Now, as far as acidic groups obviously we've already mentioned the carboxylic acid groups of aspartic acid and glutamic acid and um, both aspartic acid and glutamic acid um, will be can be ionized as physiological pH because of their pKa value so the pK of aspartic acid is 3.6. pK of glutamic acid will be about 4-ish, 4 4.2. Now similarly to the N terminus, uh, the C terminus, the carboxylic acid is ionized at physiological pH. However, oftentimes this carboxylic acid moiety is, is modified as well. So you may not always see that interaction take place. Okay. Again, as a as a note, uh, the environment can play a role in enhancing or reducing these ionic interactions. Basically, the pH of the environment is going to determine whether or not these will be um, acidic or basic. And, and I mentioned physiological pH. Physiological pH is, is usually we, we say it's 7.4, but whether you're in the stomach where it's very acidic, or the small intestine, that pH can be different. So the environment can play a role in increasing or decreasing the ability of um, these ionic bonds to form. All right, so non-covalent bonding, we're still dealing with that. Um, in this slide, we're talking about ion-dipole and dipole-dipole interactions. So those interactions occur because there is a charge difference, charge difference between two atoms involving a bond. So for instance, this amide here, because of the difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the oxygen, this oxygen is going to be, a par uh, has a partial charge that's negative, and the carbon is going to have a partial charge that's positive. So, and then you, you look at the oxygen and the hydrogen here. This Oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So you have a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen here. Now, the negative charge on the oxygen can then interact in a dipole, because this is a dipole, and there's another dipole here. You can have a dipole-dipole interaction, a dipole-dipole interaction. So just as a, um, as a note of, cush, of, of cush, caution, these amino acids written here are hypothetical amino acids, so I'm not implying that this is the actual amino acid that this molecule is going to react with in biological systems. So these are only used as examples to help our understanding of the binding interactions. So in this case, uh, azetibibe is going to react in a dipole-dipole uh, manner with aspargine 
because of the difference in the charges of the um, atoms that are involved in the bonds. Okay. Now, chlorpheniramine, which is um, um, chlorpheniramine, which has a quaternary ammonium ion here, is going to interact in a ion dipole manner with the threonine group that we have. Again, the difference between the charges, the difference between the electronegativity of these two groups here, oxygen and hydrogen, is going to give a partial negative charge to the oxygen, partial positive charge to the hydrogen, and enable the ion dipole interaction to take place. So let's talk a little bit about um, electronegativity, okay? So oxygen and nitrogen are more electronegative, more electronegative than carbon and hydrogen. So when you have a bond between those two, likely to see the negative, partial negative charge on oxygen, partial positive here on carbon. Similarly with nitrogen. Partial negative. Partial positive here. because they're more electronegative. Now, sulfur and hydrogen have similar electronegativities. Sulfur and hydrogen have similar electronegativities. So 2.58 for sulfur and 2.20 uh, for hydrogen. This will still have a dipole, however, because First, there is a slight difference, but also the sulfur uh, is, is bigger, is larger, and so you will still have a dipole forming where the sulfur will hold the partial negative and the hydrogen will hold the partial positive. So this is something to remember um, when you're dealing with these molecules. If there is a possibility of a charge, of an electronegativity difference between the atoms involved in the bond, you can have a dipole and then have dipole-dipole or ion-dipole types of um, interactions. Okay, ion-dipole type of interactions. All right, so let's move on to the next. So the next type of bonds that we're looking at are hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding are really a type or a form of dipole-dipole interactions that happen. So when you look at this uh, picture here, it looks as if this hydrogen is serving as a bridge between two electronegative groups. Okay, So this hydrogen is serving as a bridge between this electronegative group and this electronegative group here. The group of the atom that is actually bonded to the hydrogen is called the hydrogen bond donor. And the one that is engaging in the interaction that does not have the hydrogen is, is called the hydrogen bond receptor. Okay. Now, there are many different instances where you have hydrogen bond formation happen. For instance, let's take a look at this. And why do we say that this is a form of dipole-dipole interaction? So you have a partial negative charge here on the oxygen, partial positive on the hydrogen, and the same for the serine group here, which allows this morphine to engage into a hydrogen bonding interaction with the receptor. Um, another example here, where we could draw a partial negative here, partial positive, 
on the oxygen there will be a partial negative on this one and you have a hydrogen bond here between the isopretinol and uh, this potential amino acid here and then again here partial positive partial negative partial positive you have another hydrogen bond that is formed here between the uh, tyrosine and the isopretinol now these hydrogen bonds are very important to help in maintaining the structural integrity of DNA, of proteins, as they can form both intramolecular, right here, form intramolecular and intramolecular between two different molecules. So this will be an intermolecular hydrogen bond, and this is intramolecular type of hydrogen bonding. It forms within the same molecule. Now, so let's take a quick look at these hydrogen bond acceptors and donors here. So, the ketone here has lone pairs of electrons. When you look at this molecule, the partial negative, so this can engage in hydrogen bonding with another group here uh, I'm sorry I'm having difficulties with my, with my pen today alright so quickly going through this so uh, these will be hydrogen bond acceptors acceptors These will also be hydrogen bond acceptors, especially the nitrogen here has a lone pair, specifically the nitrogen here has a lone pair, electron that can engage in hydrogen bonding activity. Um, then you have uh, here these lone pairs here can engage in hydrogen bonding. Fiorine can also engage in hydrogen bonding. As you see, this will be partially negative, this will be partially positive, and so it can engage in hydrogen bonding activity. Uh, moving a little bit quicker, we've already mentioned the difference in electronegativity between the sulfur and hydrogen will grant the sulfur partial negative and the hydrogen partial positive and allow um, this to be this hydrogen to be to engage in dipole dipole interaction if on the other hand there is a electronegative group such as uh, such as maybe a nitrogen you can have hydrogen bonding interaction happen there okay so I'm spending a little too much time on this slide here let me speed up quickly and th so these will give you the list of the hydrogen bond acceptors uh, acceptors and donors so these ones are only acceptors they don't have any hydrogens to give these ones are donors they have a hydrogen here to give and these ones are acceptors and donors okay so they can accept and they can also donate a hydrogen bond uh, just uh, last words here for hydrogen bonding um, hydrogen bonds can actually help strengthen other types of interactions that are already happening in uh, between the molecules or vice versa so if you begin, as we said, ionic bonds are going to be able to form at, at, a, um, at a longer distance. So they're likely to form first. But as the bond is forming and those two groups are getting closer together, it allows for a hydrogen bond interaction to also take place and strengthen and strengthen the interaction between the fluoros of I2 is hypothetical receptor here. And so that's where the additive effect of all these uh, binding interactions come to place. So you start with the ionic bonding and then you add the hydrogen bond interactions as well. Moving on here, you can also have um, you can also have uh, one minute here. 
yeah so you can also have non-covalent type of interactions um, happening okay non-covalent type of interactions specifically van der Waal interactions so individual van der Waal interactions are usually very weak individual van der Waal interactions are weak and they range anywhere between uh, 0 0.5 to 1 kilocalorie per mole. So the ability to form van der Waal interaction is proportional to 1 over uh, r to the fourth and that speaks of the distance between uh, speaks of the distance between the different atoms, okay? So let's see this one and that one here. So 1 over R4, all right? So, so van der Waal interactions are really uh, induced, what we call induced dipole type of interactions. They're an induced dipole, dipole type of interactions. And they're basically, um, they're basically an interaction between hydrophobic groups hydrophobic groups. So you can, for instance, let's take a look at this here, uh, over here. Okay. So because of the proximity of these carbons, in a normal situation, um, the, these two, in the, the, the bonds between the two carbons here will have no polarity. That's in a normal situation. Okay. However, when you have an adjacent or a close by group, that has polarity, for instance, the oxygen and the hydrogen here, because of the different electronegativity, you're gonna have a partial negative charge here and a partial positive charge here. Because of the proximity of these groups to this aliphatic uh, chain here, the, the, you then have an induced dipole in the aliphatic chain. So you're gonna have an induced dipole here. It is the presence of the induced dipole that's then going to allow those van der Waal interactions to take place. And that's how we can have interactions between um, these two chains here, where we have pi stacking. Okay, because of the induced dipole. Now, what we call hydrophobic interaction um, is really, is, is not a real bond. So hydrophobic interaction does not refer to a real bond. It rather, re, it rather refers to a gain in entropy that, is, that, is, that happens when two hydrophobic compounds exclude water that separates them and come together. So you have two hydrophobic compounds. You have one here in A that is surrounded by water molecules. Then you have another here that is also surrounded by water molecule. When those two hydrophobic groups exclude water, the gain in entropy is what's called hydrophobic interaction. So now you have an interaction between this compound and that compound because water has been excluded and those two are closer together and can interact in a hydrophobic manner. All right, so finally, uh, one type of bond that's non-covalent that exists is uh, chelation and complexation. Chelation and complexation. So when we talk about chelation, it's a process where two distinct electron donating groups, two distinct electron donating groups are going to interact with a metal ion to form a ring structure. Okay, so you have two distinct electron donating groups that are on the same molecule are going to interact with a metal ion to form a ring structure. So that's what we call um, chelation. 
So we call collisions. Okay. Now it is uh, you observe collision in many different scenarios. Uh, in the case of EDTA, for instance, uh, I believe it's ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Ethylene diamine. So ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. One, two, three, four. Okay. So EDTA for short. Uh, EDTA is used in lead toxicity. It's used in lead toxicity. And EDTA can chelate lead. And it's basically used to, um, to treat lead toxicity. As you know, lead toxicity can lead to, um, I mean, it can lead to death. Okay. Now, this is also going to be used to treat hypercalcemia. So if you have too much calcium, for instance, EDTA can be used to treat that. And um, if you have cardioglycosides, induced arrhythmias, EDTA can also you be used to to treat that as well. Okay, so here quickly in a nutshell is uh, what we call um, chelation. All right, complexation is a bit different. So complexation has to do instead of forming some kind of a ring structure, complexation doesn't do that. But you still have an interaction of um, the molecule with a metal ion. So it forms a complex. That's also a form of interaction that is possible, as in the case of captopril and remiprilat. Often those complex are helpful in activating the drug or helpful in uh, stabilizing the binding of the drug to its receptor. Okay, there you have it for this lecture. Um, go through it and we'll be able to discuss it in class together. Thank you.